everyone a very good afternoon uh, we shall be starting in next 2 minutes uh, just waiting for a few more uh, audience to join in thank you everyone hello all a very good afternoon uh, before i start i just wanted to know if i am audible yes sir thank you so much thank you so much so hello all a very good afternoon myself ekta dubey and on behalf of the brinalytics team and our partner ozone tel we welcome you all and thank you so much for being part of our webinar which is future ready bpos transforming agents and customer experience before we start the webinar there are few guidelines that i would like to highlight and make you people aware of i would request all the attendees to be on mute and please switch off their videos also when the speakers are taking the session there would be a q and a after each session where the attendees can ask to the respective speakers if any we have set a few guidelines uh, for the q and a you need to raise your hands and mute yourself introduce yourself and put your question to the concerned speaker as i've mentioned requesting the attendees to please mute yourself moving on i would first like to introduce our partner ozone tel to speak about them ozone tel is an industry leader within the customer experience space offering businesses a robust omni channel platform to manage end to end communication flows the ai powered full stack platform has enabled over 2500 plus businesses to simplify manage and analyze interactions at every step of their customer communication and engagement journey their platform has helped enterprises to engage with customers at every touch point across voice chat sms whatsapp and other digital channels ozone tel offers its customers a global infrastructure that is fully compliant with the telecom regulations across united states south and middle east asia and india before we move to the interesting webinar uh, we are going to share a feedback form in some time on the chat box so i would request all the attendees to please fill it because it really helps us to improve and help our partners also today we are here to hear some interesting insights on what future ready bpo looks like what more they can offer how they can gear up the disruption ai will create and transform agents and customer experiences we have wonderful set of speakers who will share and enrich in us with their thoughts on the subject introducing our speakers 
we have Mr. Ajay Chambula, Associate Director Technology with First Source, Mr. Saurabh Kumar, Senior Vice President with O Source Global, Mr. Yahya Rashid, Global Head of LD and Workforce Transformation Digital Workplace with HCA Technologies, Mr. Lakhan Joshi, Business Support Director of 5S Digital, Mr. Rajiv Bharatan, Senior Vice President Sales with Ozone 10, <coughs> Mr. Sanjay Joshi, Chief Business Officer with Nextwell, and also introducing our moderator, Ms. Garima Gaitri from Ozone 10, who would be running the entire show. So once again, thank you all the audience. Thank you for speakers. And thank you, Garima, for being here. Over to you, Garima. Thank you so much, Ekta, for the introduction. And I welcome you all once again. And before we begin, there's a quick uh, word for the audience. As Ekta has already highlighted the guidelines, please ensure that you are not interrupting any of our speakers. And please do not hesitate to put across your questions in the chat box. We'll try to take up as many questions as possible. And it's always amazing to have you all so engaged and involved with us during these sessions. So thank you once again for joining us. Adjusting to the changes of the past two years without impacting customer experience and accelerating digital transformation has been quite a challenge for BPOs. And adding to it is the pressure to remain competitive while creating value for customers. We can also see how business continuity has acquired a new meaning and a hybrid working model is an integral part of this shift. BPOs definitely realize that a smarter workforce and lower attrition is critical to building future-proof strategies. Technology can be a game changer, introducing simple ways to manage this new workforce, improving the seamless CRM integrations or more transformative AI-based tools. Undoubtedly, BPOs need to move with the times. So today our focus will be to understand what future-ready BPOs look like, what more they can offer, how they can gear up for the disruption AI will create, and transform agent and customer experiences. Mm -hmm. On this note, I open the floor for all our speakers. Let's try and understand from your experience and expertise, what are some of the biggest challenges in BPO industry? So Sanjay, would you like to open the session for us? Sure, uh, thanks Garima. Um, so it so happened that yesterday I was attending a NASCOM um, event and uh, all the industry leaders were there. And this was, um, you know, this was a discussion that they were having, what are the challenges? And there were four recurring themes that they talked about. The first of which was technology itself. Uh, you know, they talked about uh, service model disruptions, service delivery, how it has changed. Uh, they talk, talked about GRC, ESG, um, uh, ARG, how the technology is going to affect. Uh, the other was uh, organization changes and new market dynamics, which was with respect to how the deals are going to get stuck, what the pricing models, et cetera, would be. And then there were other issues like uh, the EMEA, war in EMEA, forex fluctuations, uh, you know, potential global recession. But the biggest of them all was talent. And we also believe that ta currently talent is the biggest challenge because um, there is a demand supply gap because of which the, the salaries have got overheated, which in turn has made the at least, which kind of has a destabilizing uh, effect on the operations. Now that is one part of it. The other part is that once you have an, uh, once you have a situation which needs to be handled, the whole of leadership is focusing on that area and they are not even looking at um, pipeline building kind of a thing. And so everybody is distracted there. So talent definitely is one of the major challenges. And the other part is that, uh, which is the hybrid model, which you also mentioned, uh, it is still evolving. You know, three years from home was 5% of the workforce uh, of the associates, the agents, and uh, it, it went to 95 to 100%. And now the, organize, uh, now the organizations want these is and that's very e easier said than done and that has presented a challenge uh, on its in its own right mm -hmm. so there's a lot of churn at the end of this churn there will be a good situation which will emerge out but while it is happening and it's taking place right now 
there will be a short term pain. So these were some of the challenges. Uh, totally wholeheartedly kind of endorse this. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Sanjay, for sharing these with us. And uh, Lakhan, how would you like to add to this narrative? What are some of the biggest challenges that you are currently perceiving in the uh, BPO industry space? Yeah, so thank you for that, Garima. So as rightly mentioned by Sanjay, okay, so talent uh, is the challenge right now, okay? If you look at the requirement versus the delivery we have, okay, uh, be it the... Uh, like two, two years down the line and the current situation, it's critical and everyone is hunting for the people, okay? But uh, everyone is short with people now, right? Nowadays, and because of that, uh, the stress of existing people who is working on the processes, LOVs, okay? They have huge workload to manage. So mm -hmm. this is one challenge right now, yes. Uh, the, another one I can say is uh, while the technology coming into the picture, okay? Now, uh, if we talk about the call center, call center agent or the executives, their job is now very difficult. And why? So earlier, the calls or the chats they used to get was the any query, general, normal, where is my order, how to cancel it, and all that, right? Now, uh, chat, self, uh, chatbots, self-help, IVRS, and all that. So those queries are being solved by the technology, okay? Mm -hmm. Now the questions, those coming to the call center executive or the agents are the difficult one, right? So, and those are critical cases wherein they are difficult to handle or those are escalations, frustrated customers, they are coming on the one board, right? right. So this is the challenge currently we have. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. And as you talk about, you know, uh, the query is getting complex. How do you suggest uh, businesses navigate through this? Because this is where we need to, uh, you know, work upon building a, a very strong knowledge base. So how do you suggest uh, uh, businesses go ahead with this? Absolutely. So uh, at five, so basically uh, with the experience and with these challenges, we have, a, we have uh, come up with CX first or SaaS system. Okay, so what we are doing is uh, two. Okay, there are three type of challenges which we can call out. Okay, one is the talent acquisition and the training of the people. Okay, so this is training management system we can call that. Then we have a DMS which is a, a decision making making system. Okay, so now uh, to your question. So basically, what we do is we 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 set a inventory wherein we with the critical questions, how to respond to them, what are the situations in this scenario, what needs to be done, what needs to be responded to the customer. Inventories are available into the system so that the executive can refer to them. He can just do a wild search into that system particularly, and he can search the answer to that particular query or the situation, and he can respond immediately to the customer. Right, right. Thank you so much, Lakan. Yeah. So, Alok, how would you like to uh, add to this uh, narrative and what are some of the biggest challenges that you are currently perceiving in the... All have the thank you, Garima. Uh, I think we all have the same uh, boat. And the only thing which Sanjay totally concur and endorsed my fellow co you know, co panelist Sanjay's point that we only have a talents issue. And it's, 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 he you know, com completed the entire circle of this challenge. He said that we do not have a talent, and those ta we, those talents which we have are continuously churning, are moving from point A to point B, creating a complete lag within the systems. And I agree with you, though there is business has not grown, but everybody has a shortage of resources. I'm mm -hmm. surprised that how this has happened. It's only because the resources are moving and there is a gap, there's a void which has been created because of this churn, and everybody is struggling. And I'm also hopeful that ultimately this comes to a halt and we get the right people. But I wanted to take it to the next level that why there is a shortage, even if it is there, we have a people. It is not that everybody is leaving at a one time. We still have a certain resources who are there with us. So can't we fill them? It, this industry has you know, never treated the resources with the talent grooming. We always have the talent acquisition forum. And now we should focus on the talent grooming, letting the people from the bottom grow up to the next level so that they can fill the position rather than waiting for two months or three months that somebody else will come and fill the place mm -hmm. then we are having the 
more footing situations. So I think talent is the one thing. Second, I would concur is the pricing with the with the direct cost as our resource cost. Mm -hmm. And if it is going up, your margins are skewed. We need to think short term survival is always on the pricing. So we need to think about the pricing that how we structure ourselves and go to the customer. Ensuring that the, we were customer and we both have a win-win situation. I think these, if we address these two things, we'll be in a good shape. Mm -hmm. Right, absolutely. So that's it from my side. Yeah, yeah. And just to uh, add to it, you know, when you're talking about talent, when you're talking about human resource, what are some of the skills that you're looking at uh, that, you know, uh, people should prioritize? or employers should be looking at when they are selecting these uh, candidates? I think it's, it's more to do with the jobs which we have, number one, that's that's a primary. Secondary is definitely an, uh, an outlook of a resource who is who can communicate, interact to his fellow, uh, res, uh, I would say colleagues, and also to the customer to a certain extent being established. I think resource is good enough to you know, look out mm -hmm. for. Mm -hmm. and ultimately the resource has a gene to go you know to grow and go to the next level that's for sure absolutely moving on uh, rajiv how would you like to uh, answer this question what are some of the biggest challenges that uh, you feel that the industry is experiencing at the moment yeah hi so uh, my views were pretty much similar in terms of the tech part and uh, the uh, artificial intelligence and all that. One learning today I had is that apparently there is a lack of talent or people are not able to attract talent. That is something which came as a news to me because I thought that uh, you know people want jobs and uh, there are people wanting to give jobs. So there's a contradiction of sorts there. But having said that, uh, you know when when I've had dialogues with people in the BPO industry, uh, be it captive or be it uh, outsourcing. Uh, one of the key things which they said is that having attracted the talent, uh, retaining the talent is also a big problem. Uh, like somebody just said that, you know, people uh, just go away and sometimes a bunch of people go away. And I'm told uh, that the nature of this industry is such that sometimes uh, people just don't turn up for work the next day. So on the 31st of first, they get their salary and the next day they don't even turn up. I mean, they are not into uh, relieving letters and certificates and experience certificates and all that. They just don't turn up. So what do you do? So obviously there is a, there is science to it in terms of handling a bench, you know, do the load balancing. If people don't turn up, people can take leave also. I'm not saying everybody is just going away. So that is one piece which uh, I guess everybody is grappling with. And, and this seems to be, uh, you know, BPO years old or thereabouts uh, this has been the trend from day one so why are we not able to fix it this is one big challenge because um, you know losing people then train them again and go away again so it's it's a big cycle and uh, that is something which um, i guess needs to be addressed and things like uh, pick up drop coffee tea snacks and pool tables and all this is is a given i think every every bpo has all this stuff and add to it a gym and all those kind of things so all those things are there but still people want to leave so that is something which is a challenge. And I think um, I'm not too sure when that is going to get fixed in the real sense of the word. And okay. um, the second challenge, which I found out from speaking to a CEO of a company, one of our customers is that how do you translate, translate the CEO's vision or the management's vision right down to the last man? So because, uh, for example, if it is a customer support uh, kind of a contact center practice and um, people are calling in with problems and issues, what, what have you, uh, how do you ensure that the problem is fixed in the shortest possible time and to the satisfaction of the customer? And this particular CEO I'm talking about, he had a vision and he's completely obsessed with customer sat and uh, it is not one of those fashionable obsessions, he's genuinely obsessed. So when he says that I want to serve my customer as well as anybody else in the world, real platinum class, um, how he says, how do I translate that vision to 800 odd agents who are taking calls day in and day out? Because at the end of the day, um, it is a fairly monotonous job which they're doing. They get 50, 60, 40 calls, I don't know how many, they have to attend to those calls and they come back next day and again, start all over again. So these are some of the two or three challenges I thought um, I could possibly bring to the table. Right, right. Great points, Rajiv. Thank you so much. Ajay, how would you like to uh, add to this? What are some of the gaps you are currently perceiving? While not discounting the uh, people aspect of it, I think I would like to bring in the technology aspect of it also. Like uh, over a period of time, I think what has happened is um, the channels or the support channels which are there were spun uh, based on the need of the hour. 
Like for example, if I if I needed a phone support, I would add a phone. If I needed email support, I would add an email. I would add a chat support, and everything is like um, uh, across the place. And I think going forward, uh, if Uh, the ai ml everything is coming into play and the agent experience or the customer experience has to improve all these channels have to cohesively talk to each other like for example if i have sent a mail and i'm following it to go back and correlate and say that hey you have already sent the mail to this back i i i would like to go back and address the concern now or this is how you should go back and address so or that um, uh, journey of do, to a true omni channel experience We are able to go back and collate all the channels into a single thing, and then drive the customer journey. It would be one more challenge based on whatever um, uh, rollouts we passed experience with Oracle with the twenty-five thousand odd agents with various other businesses coming in. So that cohesion between various channels and driving that customer journey uh, through that channels, a single point of view being driven across all channels, I think is is one more challenge. Mm-hmm. Mr. Uh, Rashid, what are your thoughts, and how are you looking at uh, the current challenges in the BPO industry? Yeah, I, definitely. You know, I think we've uh, um, at least have been in this uh, BPO industry for the last twenty odd years. Um, you know, uh, I started off my career with uh, Dell in uh, Bangalore, and this uh, resource talent uh, challenge was there everywhere. Every uh, demand used to go up different uh, cycles of uh, it transformation i think uh, we used to run helter skelter but i, I think as uh, i think after uh, the improvement in terms of the compute and technology and with a lot of uh, um, you know uh, i would not say you know more glamorize this artificial intelligence still still there it's not uh, uh, completely cannibalized to most of the work as we uh, perceive but there are a lot of uh, you know i think low hanging fruits that we can automate uh, which was existent earlier also uh, within the bpos right i think what we are doing uh, you know i think i think organizations today shouldn't be fixated about about uh, about uh, uh, about a certain skill and about a certain degree as 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 a gate um, you know we because from my expertise i've been working with uh, we we have uh, got these uh, concept of tech bees where uh, people with last two or 12 grads who are doing phenomenally well they are able to challenge the status quo what we look at from a talent standpoint and and we are like producing a lot of good talent right across our schools and and so on so with that we can look at as you know probably the the um, you know employee uh, is curious enough in terms of knowing to understand and so on so get those churn in um, uh, you know forget about the churn churn will happen get these people uh, at at the 12th grades train them on the skills don't focus on the degrees you know get them on the right skill you know as we have evolved we one thing we have figured out right with all the digital transformation and so on uh, it's not the breadth of the knowledge that matters now it's the depth of the knowledge so expose them in what is required you know for, for, if an agent is providing the support on certain key technology expose them rather than giving the entire gamut of it cut down the training timelines and uh, and and you know you can increase the billability uh, uh, you know time to value is accelerated and so on right and then uh, along with that considering that churn will exist strengthen your knowledge management uh, process so that you know people are don't carry the knowledge along with them that's the biggest struggle today organizations face right um you know so much of people dependencies cut that and and bring that uh, cut that slack and bring that document there are a lot of tools today available in the within the marketplace both home grown and uh, which are available on the cloud get those uh, you know pretty much uh, uh, have have that sorted with these automation tools i think we should be able to sustain this uh, resource challenges will be there and uh, what are the specific interventions uh, training and learning interventions that we should bring in uh, that is uh, not a kind of a bandage solution but looking at it from a, a you know a fast sighted approach where what we are looking at not not focusing on plan but a quarter to quarter plan what kind of uh, certifications that we need to enable our people to get there i think that that really solves most of our challenges and that's right. my perspective 
Right, right. Thank you so much, Mr. Rashid. And I think we've got some great points to dive deeper into the discussion later on. So uh, all good here. And now I would like uh, Sanjay to help us understand, you know, what has been the story of Next Wealth, because we know there's a tremendous growth, there's a tremendous growth story there. What has been the approach? What would you say have been the key pillars of your growth and success so far? We would love to understand that side of the story. So I think what really has worked for us uh, is, um, you know, a set of three, four ideas here. And the first one is the purpose and the vision. And the purpose and the vision is basically um, 10, 11 years back, um, the founders decided that we should, we, there's, a, there's a gap in these small towns where the 60 to 70% of the graduates in India are based out of small towns and hardly any job opportunities there. And therefore, if a job can, can be brought down from a US or UK into Bangalore, uh, the same job can be done in you know, 300 kilometers away out of whatever, Salem or Mysore or any other smaller town. And uh, that resonates, that vision resonates very well with our uh, customers. So that has been uh, a really a good experience. But in addition to that, there is, uh, you know, there is a singular focus on quality from our side, uh, which has really uh, worked for us very well because our biggest challenge has been to uh, convince the customers that, hey, your critical project can be done out of small towns. And, you know, they always have this doubt whether there is enough talent, there is, uh, you know, it ca can it be done? Is there connectivity? Etc. Just imagine today also people ask this question, what would it have been uh, 10, 11 years back? So, so you have to kind of imagine there. Today it has become easier because uh, people have seen due to pandemic that you know, everything is possible today. But 10 years, 11 years back when the model did not exist, in some sense we were pioneers there. So resonated very well with them. And uh, we also wanted to kind of empower the women employees because uh, while the young men are allowed to go into cities and urban centers to look for career opportunities. Young women, because of cultural reasons, are not allowed. And so that talent is totally wasted there. They have to compromise whatever jobs they get there. And we have seen firsthand that the moment you empower young women, it, it is very, very transformative. Absolutely. So that vision, then the singular focus on quality. The third is, uh, you know, total customer centricity. While everyone here obviously uh, is customer centric, but in our case, you know, many a times you, we had initially these uh, FTE based models where when you, the more efficient you get, uh, it is not to our advantage. But having said that, we have delivered in many cases, 100% efficiencies, knowing fully well that it may be in the short term, it may not really help us. But that has really helped us because the customer sees that there is sincerity in, in the overall delivery of the project. and. We have looked at uh, process improvement. We have created tools, technologies, platforms that enable us to do that on a consistent basis. That has also resonated uh, very well mm -hmm. uh, with the customers and a very big use of technology. I mean, uh, we, have, we have collaborated with technology providers, plus in-house we have developed several tools mm -hmm. which have uh, allowed us to kind of deliver this kind of uh, consistent grade of uh, service. So today, uh, after nearly 11, 12 years, uh, starting from zero, we have 4,500 people working for us. 60% uh, uh, of uh, them are women across six centers in four different states uh, with an attrition rate of less than 19%. So when I was, I was mentioning tal about the talent deficit, I was kind of talking about the industry in general. That's the sense I got yesterday. Mm -hmm. uh, but our attrition rate is uh, around 18%, less than 19%, as I said, uh, and an NPS score of 70. So obviously there is something right that we are doing, uh, which is resonating very well with the customers. And the challenges, as I said, was convincing the customers that this kind of stuff could be done. So initially we've done pilots to convince them. And we, we said that let's do a trial for some uh, period of time or any other model that would kind of give them the confidence uh, that this can be uh, done. Mm -hmm. And the approach that we have applied is from inside, we just walk the talk. There are so many things that we articulate to our teams, the purpose, uh, you know, the vision, the ethics, we walk the talk and we have a process whereby we 
we train our leadership, we train our agents as well as the leaders. And most of our leaders are in-house groomed leaders. Mm -hmm. And that has helped in terms of continuity. And 29% uh, of the leadership that we have are women within the organization. And most of them have stayed with us, have been working for us from a, uh, for a long, long time. Mm -hmm. And so these are some of the things that really have helped us. Uh, right. And uh, yeah, these four things that come to my mind. Very inspiring, very inspiring, Sanjay. And I think uh, walking the talk has really made the difference here. And that is what that counts because otherwise it's all jargons, right? And translating that into action is what uh, takes all the courage. So thank you for sharing your journey with us. Moving on, uh, Rajiv, we would like to understand from you, what are some of the biggest roadblocks that you perceive in understanding, first of all, in identifying if BPOs are working to their optimum potential? And where do you see uh, the role of CCAS in all of this? Okay, um, as far as BPOs are concerned, I think, uh, of course, we've got a panel of experts here. Uh, most BPOs have a certain uh, fundamental set of metrics which they measure. So, you know, if it is a voice uh, BPO, uh, typically they uh, would measure average talk time, they measure the after call time, they measure the uh, calls in queue. And so there are various four or five or six parameters by which you can judge whether your uh, BPO is functioning, um, you know, at, at, at the right efficiency. Um, so typically when we talk of, uh, with no offense men to on-prem uh, service providers, uh, the CCAS players like us, we have we have, we have been able to provide a certain set of uh, the reporting and the and the dashboards and the portals where supervisors and team leaders and you know management everybody you know can just log in and see what is the efficiency of the floor or what is the efficiency of a particular uh, campaign or a particular location, what have you. So giving very enriched reports, very uh, giving good uh, uh, reporting tools by which you can easily measure. Uh, even on an hourly basis as to what is the efficiency of your BPO. So to that extent, I think that has again not changed. So if we give them five, six, seven metrics which they would need to measure, depending on the process, one or two may vary here and there, but that's what it takes to run an efficient BPO. Similarly, a lot of inputs we give in terms of training. So training is another very important facet which uh, you know agents have to go through. And that is something which is continuous. So that, again, if we are able to highlight, if CCAS players are able to do that, we are able to highlight what are the deficiencies or what are the um, you know, parameters on which the agents need to be trained better or they have to be given certain inputs so that even things like voice modulation, you know, the rate of speech at which an agent is speaking, all those kinds uh, kind of things come into play. So once we are able to give these kind of inputs, I think measuring the efficiency of the BPO becomes fairly simple. Uh, uh, in that sense. And then once you have all the data points and once you have all the reports and, you know, uh, mm -hmm. this with you, the management can take appropriate decisions as uh, they go by. Right, right. So how can we train the agents better is a very important point. And moving on, uh, Saurabh, I would like to understand from you, what are some of the initiatives have you taken to improve the agent experience? How can we simplify their lives? That's a very important question. And uh, it would be great if you could uh, break that down for us. What are some of the initiatives that you have particularly, you know, uh, taken at your organization and in what ways has it helped enhance the uh, agent experience? True. So that's a really nice question that what we have done for them, they have been doing everything for us. So what we have done for them, that's a very important thing. And it is basically, it leads from the discussion that are we really doing something to create talent and definitely uh, to retain them as well. So first and foremost, what we are doing. So there are two ways to look at it. There is a transformation. So we identify with, uh, I would call it a set of process or would call it a silos in which we identify that there are certain exceptional resources who are looking to the transform the process. We pick them up and they become our leader. And then we map them, understand, and then we create, you know, map them with the similar processes which belongs to their particular silo. They understand, try to standardize the process, number one, then create the training materials which they feel could be as, you know, uh, important for the other agents to utilize, consume, and create a much better experience. That's the first thing which we do. Second is that we, we have, a, you know, as a ingrained DNA, it's our DNA that 
speak to the customer because he tells that what exactly is needed you know the delight is is a common word but and but you know that what exactly the customer need the changes may vary from the degree of delight may vary from one point to another point but ultimately a, a, an ask is a customer's ask so we listen in try to incorporate that into the process through training and through transformative efforts we also have brought in the technology into the piece we are have in house capabilities at on the technology side being its its we also have a comprehensive technology side so we developed around it we have created a modules around it and tried to improvise that that particular system or that particular silo in itself Mm -hmm. So uh, there could be, you know, we were discussing about the DMS. DMS is one of the product which which is there into the market. We all also have workflow management systems through which the so internal communication is clean, consistent, and continuous. While we while my transformative agent is speaking with the the team down there, right. that's one. Again, to make them and reward them. And when I'm saying transformative agent, I'm not speaking about the in person. I'm also speaking about the systems. My systems have become my transformative agents as well. So, for example, you know, and we recognize them. So, for example, I have a comprehensive uh, suit. I understand that there is a small piece of it which can help a comprehensive process automation around it. We pick them up, module them give them a separate recognition like i give a separate recognition to my you know human agent i give that separate recognition to my machine agent, agent as well and say that this is a product who this will work and qualify the effort or would help the reduce effort in this particular area for example we have a it's a very small tool you know uh, it's an accounting system in which every accounting system has a small piece of reconciliation tool mm -hmm. We picked up the reconciliation tool. We created a larger, you know, if we created build the MI and ML to it and try to create a system which caters the larger portion of the need rather than be becoming a complete accounting system. It, it, it works as an independent system for processing a you know million transactions in a in a, in a month kind of system. Mm -hmm. So the, these are the things which we understand and recognize, and that is how we you know uh, take it to uh, transformative events. Absolutely. Yeah. So, Adabin, to what extent uh, do you see this translating into a uh, better customer experiences? So, if I could say so, uh, we have a degree of, you no, know, I would say that we measure ourselves that how my customer has grown and how exactly I have reduced the effort, or I would say putting the services into the place. I would call it anywhere between 30. Pre-COVID, we have been able to address that 30% into the, you know, in terms of the growth versus my team deployment or my service deployment has been maintained. So we have been able to achieve to extent of 28 to 30% pre-COVID. We are not measuring currently because, you know, it's a hybrid model. Things are not exactly in the same position as it was. Benchmarking are a little tough, but yes, I can say that we can again go back to those levels once again. Right, right, right. Thank you. Uh, and uh, digitization and AI, we also understand that BPOs need to stay relevant in an automation first world. So a big question today is that if companies begin to deploy AI based bots, will the need for BPOs increase or decrease? BPOs definitely need to tap into their expertise and offer a differentiated service. This is something that we all can agree on. But uh, what could be the biggest differentiator here? And are you looking at AI as a threat or an opportunity? I would like uh, Mr. Rashid to answer this uh, for us. Sure. So, so from, see, uh, I think uh, this uh, artificial intelligence or MI, um, you know, machine learning, all of this is, will keep cannibalizing, right? Some of the low, um, uh, you know, kind of low activity, uh, which is uh, which can be uh, done uh, uh, once once the process is standardized. Now that's a given, right? But uh, within the BPO also uh, today, I think it's at a very big inflection point, right? Uh, as to how they go around uh, getting into more of process modeling, uh, uh, digital transformation. Most of the BPOs that were just delivering, uh, you know, voice-based or email-based services today are looking at uh, uh, getting into the consulting piece of it as well, because they are residing on data, 
Uh, there's a big element today is uh, they have access to what the consumer behaviors are, what the, the end product talks about because, uh, you know, the agent PPOs, uh, um, you know, the, the agents keep speaking to the customer. A lot of those informations gets passed on to and then it becomes a, a kind of a use case or a proof of concept that they can look at. That's, uh, this is going to be looked at as an opportunity for sure. Uh, and and then uh, basis this data that is available and and uh, having access to their workflows uh, today BPOs are able to do the consulting give them recommendations to the customers as to how they can actually simplify their own processes their customer processes and so on and uh, also you know get into the value uh, enabling uh, you know share a wallet uh, which is there uh, you know I, I think the recent stats is about close to 1.5 trillion dollars that is today, uh, you know, with all these, uh, uh, whether with the recession or with the COVID, a uh, lot of these uh, uh, companies uh, in the in North America and Europe didn't have the time to invest or didn't uh, have the time to relook at their processes. Uh, today, most of the companies are are really accel accelerating that and then sharing those insights uh, and making sense out of it and creating a new. Uh, fine print so the uh, within the agent community as well right there is an option a career path for them to move into more uh, high skilled uh, and more complex related uh, arena and and also the, our bpos which today uh, were mostly managing your mess for less uh, are, are getting into the value enabled services or vas which we call it helping them keep it uh, keep things in good stead so this is certainly not a threat it's a great opportunity um, you know to really stay relevant as well as ensuring that you move up the value chain absolutely absolutely lakhan how would you like to uh, add to this narrative uh, how are you looking at this big picture and what could be the big differentiator here for bpos okay uh, so see uh... Technology, it is a never, never a threat in my personal view. Okay, uh, it is enabling us to deliver more or do best. Okay, so this is my simple and general view. I follow it. Uh, while the technology is coming into the picture or more into the AI automation is uh, involved into the PPO industry now, uh, with this it will be helpful for uh, the delivery and increasing the CX experience. Uh, this is what I see. Okay. At the same time, it is not a threat to anyone who is working or it is like we, earlier we used to think that yes, if uh, technology is there, then the jobs will be not there. But that is not the case. While implementing the technology, there are ample things to do, which can be done by humans only. Okay, uh, Training the system, giving the right input to the system. Right. So in that case, uh, like rightly mentioned by Yaha as well. Okay. Uh, the human, those are working right now, they will be more skill, skillful, they'll learn new technology, okay, new things, and they will give the inputs to the technology and the system to drive. Right, right. Ajay, what are your thoughts on this? I think you're in mute. Uh, Ajay, you're in mute. I think the, the way to look at this is like, um, um, if you ask me a direct question, is technology going to cannibalize or the bots are going to cannibalize human capital? No. Uh, we are not at that point, uh, at least for one, two years, in my opinion. But uh, how do you see the uh, differentiation happening when the technology and the human are able to collaborate and then go back and give a value? That's when it's going to, that's what it was moving towards. Like a simple example can be, I can introduce a technology into a voice which detects a sentiment of the customer and gives a recommendation or a, a simple visual to the agent. Hey, customer is getting aggravated, toned down. So it's simple. It's a technology going back and assisting an agent to go back and perform his job in a better way. Mm -hmm. So whenever tech, this, this is what like any collaboration of technology and agent is what will drive the differentiation. And that's what I see uh, 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 how the uh, industry is moving towards. Yeah. Right, right. So we've got some great... If I could uh, just add to that, yeah. I'll take a minute. Yeah, uh, so what Ajay just said in terms of uh, the agent getting prompted and the agent getting help uh, while on a call, because at the end of the day, we have to make his or her life easier in terms of handling the customer query. So Ajay, just for your information, this technology is already available and sentiment analysis is something which is um, uh, at least through 90, 95% accuracy is completely available. Yes. In yes. The, another thing, if I could add to that is what I have realized after speaking to some people is how empowered are the agents? 
So, for example, if the agent is handling a simple inbound customer success, a customer uh, service process, uh, the empowerment level of the agent also there is a direct uh, bearing on the satisfaction of the customer. So, if the agent is able to take a decision and kill the problem right there and then rather than getting into a conference with the supervisor or getting an approval and telling the customer I'll come back to you an empowered agent and and in contact centers where uh, or bpos where agents are empowered um, i think the csat ratios or the csat ratings are better yeah and continuing on the same thought i think we are implementing this for two of our clients where we are going back and deploying this agent as kind of a solution which includes sentiment real time alerts all those are happening for internal important deployment how we will go live next month great okay right yeah and before we move uh, to concluding the remarks, there are some thoughts by the audience here, and I think we can take up uh, one question, which is regarding moonlighting. Um, Mr. Asim uh, asks, moonlighting has been a challenge in the news lately. Why are the current organizations lacking that an employee has to look at multiple jobs, better pay, more learning opportunities? So any of you could take this out. I think I, I'll have a stab at that. Um, I think moonlighting is something that, you know, organizations may resist, but uh, it is something uh, which they cannot stop. Um, on one hand, how can we be talking about uh, gig economy um, where people have the freedom to kind of, uh, you know, decide when they are going to work and what they are going to work on and from where they're going to work on. And on the other hand, uh, uh, we we'll, we are saying that okay this is not allowed and uh, especially uh, you know in the context of ai ml doing the routine jobs you will see that there will be a lot of focus on specialist resources and if if that is the case it's not something that you can churn out in in dozens or millions uh, uh, and you know uh, look at the require looking comparing it with the requirement and therefore, you will inevitably uh, reach a place where all these experts will be doing small, small gigs at multiple locations. Um, how that model is going to evolve? What's the, uh, you know, what's the compensation going to look like? What's the engagement model going to look like? There is a lot to happen out there. It is in the process of evolution. But uh, I personally believe that uh, it is something that cannot be stopped. And as a matter of fact, it is already happening in other countries and so there's no reason why we in India would, would kind of do uh, something other than that. Right, right. I hope that answers your uh, question, Mr. Asim. Thank you for- I think uh, uh, if I can add, uh, yeah, yeah, right, please, uh, please. I, I think, uh, you, know, you know, moonlighting uh, is today, um, at least in the, the new style of working, you know, um, a lot of people are influencers. A lot of people are, uh, you know, YouTubers. So they're getting the money, you know, whatever it is, right? But you have to, uh, you know, kind of split the rice from the shop, right? And understand what is uh, what is the what is the white and what is black, right? Uh, you, you've got to be clear. Uh, people misusing the assets given by the company and within the time, I think that's uh, that's ethics. Uh, that there's, you know, that that particular person has to get thrown out, you know, because. Yeah, there's a complete conflict of interest. I think uh, within their shift timings, if people are able to do it, uh, mm, uh, you know, with with the assets that are given by the company, it's a big no. But what you do outside of your hours, uh, you know, and uh, within your own set of uh, devices, I think that you have to split it. And of course, uh, you know, even if you move to another company after you resign, there are there is a cooling of Clause. The reason being, uh, you know, people get access to a lot of uh, company insights, you know, that can be easily misused. Uh, eventually, nobody is invested and in, has gone through. So you got to be clear about what you are moonlighting in, you know, which area you are moonlighting in, you know, and then if it's if it's clear, interest, you're you're having your own devices, you're having your own uh, time, then there's nothing wrong. You can have a, a transparent conversation. Right. That's yeah. yeah, absolutely. So Garima, right. adding to what um, Yaya said and Sanjay also communicated, I'm going trying to figure out that what exactly, you know, if this question is coming from the, uh, the oh, I would call it the employer side, that why this is uh, unethical. But understand, we in India, generally at a large place, we have always felt that the job is that the employee coming to office, 
and at the evening he is going home. So he completes his shift and goes home. So we know that he is under our observation. So we had a certainty that he is not doing anything. But that was not the benchmark. The idea was to create a job JD for him and let him per perform. If he performs in six hours and then two hours he saves it, I'm fine. He can do it anything for him. Rather than sitting and sipping a coffee in your office, he can do it. So you'll have to measure that what has been assigned, that assignment is right to his skill, to the time allotted to him, and that's it. Beyond the time, and I agree with the idea that, you know, it's ethical. You can't use the company's asset to do to gain your personal, uh, you know, uh, benefits. Right, right. That's it. Yeah. Raji, would you like to add to this? Yeah. Uh, so I think I will go with what uh, Yaya said, that, um, you know, there is, a, there is an employment contract you've signed and you're working for a company, you're using the company's infrastructure and the assets, et cetera. And obviously you have to be, uh, you know, fulfilling whatever you have to do. But then uh, uh, Saurabh says that, you know, if, if the person is uh, finishing his work in six hours and then two hours he's doing something else, he's fine with it. So, but I, I have seen, uh, I mean, and this is something which uh, moonlighting as a term is, uh, has just, we, we have come to know of it in the last six to eight weeks or three months. But I have, I have uh, you know, ridden with drivers in Uber where the person was actually working in a BPU and uh, after office hours, he's driving an Uber. Uh, I never thought he was moonlighting. He said, look, I want to, uh, I want the additional income. So I am driving the car and it's fine. So I said, yeah, absolutely fine. And uh, uh, so he was spending four or five hours after office hours or before office hours doing that. So I don't have a very strong view on this because um, slightly untouched with this phenomena as far as I'm concerned. What everybody says is uh, pretty relevant. Right, right. And uh, there is also uh, one more question by Mr. Gopi. Just to understand what about data security in this case? How is this managed? I think he's just trying to add uh, to the question uh, Mr. Asim had posed earlier. So, yes, if you would like to take this up. Uh, it's pretty much uh, clear, right? Data security will be violated uh, because you don't know what you're working on. You know, mm -hmm. uh, imagine if the if they have that. It leads to very unethical uh, kind of scenarios and situations that is not good for uh, the reputation of that particular employee as well as uh, the other person, other party as well. So, yeah, uh, come, uh, you know, we, we should not get mixed up. There are a lot of... Uh, like Upwork and all of those, right? So you can go ahead and uh, get into that kind of situation with your own set of, uh, you know, rules of the game. But mm -hmm. uh, getting this crisscross, you will be exposing to data security. You will end up having a conversation where you will quote certain uh, aspects which are confidential in nature. Um, and, and all of that exposes into big risks and, you know, Forget about, uh, you know, for the uh, bugs, your reputation, you're putting your reputation on, on the edge if you're, you know, having having this dual, duality. And that's, that's... Yeah. So moving on, as we discussed the current focus and the challenges for BPO's role of CCAS, how we can improve the agent experience, opportunities for AI and BPO agent partnership as well. Basically, we are looking at transforming BPOs into CX partners, and that is something that all of you highlighted in bits and parts, which is great. And now I would like to understand, when we say future ready, that is a term which is easier said than done, right? We are looking at strategies, future-proof strategies. So what would your suggestion be moving forward from here? What would you tell, uh, you know, for the audience or the businesses, how to navigate through these challenges and how can they actually become future ready? What does that mean for this industry? So uh, Sanjay, if you could uh, take this up and then all of you can share your insights. So I think, uh, um, you know, I kind of, uh, you know, in, in conclusion to what, what we already said is that these are interesting times and I'll connect it with the context of future ready BPOs. Um, on one hand, uh, we have a market that is still growing. Uh, the Indian IT BPO market is growing at 12%, 11.9%, and it's going to be 47 market by 2025. These are NASCOM figures. So from the current 30-odd billion. So there is market, there is growth uh, right out there. 
Then there is a confluence of uh, uh, free things. On technology front, we are seeing a lot of movement. I mean, 5G was just released. Then we are talking about augmented reality, virtual reality, uh, many such technologies that are pushing um, uh, platformization, if I may, and that is what you know we we work with ozone tell very, very uh, closely cloud uh, is uh, there and then there is platformization which is the domain side of it or uh, you know creates those platforms where people can come together and and interact which in turn is pushing digital transformation so today the way i look at it is that we can deploy innovative custom workforce engagement models so i can be working for a customer of mine from anywhere at any point of for the duration that I decide to, and I'll get paid instantly. So mm -hmm. if it is happening in bits and pieces today, and it also kind of covers uh, some of the discussion that we had on big or moonlighting. Yeah. Um, with respect to security, there are issues with respect to the ethical side of it. But I'm sure, uh, you know, while that is the, there are challenges in between. So all of us are going to be uh, uh, part of this, this whole journey where we'll have to confront the challenges, we'll have to deal with the chaos. But in, in doing that, all of us will be creating history in some sense, uh, in, in our own ways with our organizations. Mm -hmm. So my view is that it's a dynamic market. There's a, lot, there's a lot of change which is happening. There are a lot of disrupt, possible disruptions in terms of technology that are there. There is the uh, which is, uh, a desire to work from anywhere, well as you know, there's a little bit of tussle out there. So if you kind of weigh in and the customer side, which is uh, the expectation is that their uh, queries, their uh, issues will get resolved uh, immediately, instantly, and to the best profit possible pro with the best possible professionalism in the least amount of time uh, on the platform of their choice. Mm -hmm. So when you weigh all of this in, it's a very complex mix. Right. And uh, the, the key is going to be the ability of organizations to be adaptive to, to this kind of dynamic, dynamically changing situation. Um, training, uh, a lot of focus on training, uh, uh, resource enhancement is going to be part of it. And a lot of infusion of technology on all sides is going to be the only way we can deal with it. So that's my little take on this. No, that's wonderful. And uh, definitely exciting times, numerous possibilities, shifting customer expectations. Ajay, how are you looking uh, at this? What would be your vision regarding this? I think the, the way to look at this is like, um, futurity BPOs are no longer a, only a human human capital or a human capital deployment. It's a combination of technology, human, and the customer engagement. With the amount of data the BPO industry has under its under its uh, uh, purview. So I think the, the future uh, no longer when you go for a BPO of the future, it is no longer going to be a uh, people deployment. It is a consulting engagement with the combination of the technology and the customer engagement. It's the first leg to go back and talk to a customer or engaging a customer is the way to look at it. Right, right. So, how would you uh, add to this? I think uh, it is a system, more and more technology. That's what I could see here, and which my other co panelists are also agreeing to the fact. And beyond that, we need to understand that, let's go back to the drawing board and understand that what extra could we ask for from our customers, making mm -hmm. them comfortable first thing and creating this as a benchmark, reaching out to the others in the fraternity, saying also be also, this could also be given to the outside the periphery of your own domain. And there are people who can deliver you better ways. So mm -hmm. finding out the new, new ideas, the new array, is to get an other side of the business is something which you'll have to say. And I know we have a mantra, rather it's it's a basically outsourcing mantra that do tell to the customer, do the best and outsource everything rest to us. So so that's how we need to come, you know, go back to our customer and keep asking that, you know, and that is where because the, the things will change. What we are doing will somebody 
we train the people, we have the people, they will go back to the other side. They will say that, look, this is comfortable, can be done. So only ever evolving situation can make us future ready. Right, right. That's it. Go, go back to the customer. That's a great point. Lakhan, how would you like I think you're on mute, yeah. Okay, so all the pointers are covered, but yes, uh, rightly mentioned by Saurabh as well, that we need to uh, like keep an eye on okay, what is changing, okay, how, how the market is reacting, okay, what are the technologies uh, getting into the picture. So that is very important and to stay relevant. Okay? At the same time, uh, in the current processes or uh, the campaigns we have, we can, we can do value adds, we can implement technology there, right? So with that only, uh, you stay relevant with the technology time in this time. Yeah. Right, right. Yeah. Mr. Rashid, your uh, final thoughts, please. You're on mute. I think pretty much what uh, most of my, uh, uh, you know, uh, colleagues and panelists have shared uh, pretty much. Uh, I think what we'll see is more into getting into the niche area of uh, the consulting piece, um, you know, um, you make use of your oil, that is your data uh, that today you're uh, currently uh, residing with. I think uh, what I'll see, uh, what I see is that most of the BPOs will get into more mature, what I call it as sassification and pacification, right, uh, of uh, various uh, uh, things so that, you know, they, that, that's where they'll be delivering scale, uh, delivering value anywhere, you know, the um, as an economy uh, kind of uh, deliver as an economy kind of a model is what will start getting evolved, uh, you know, in the future. So, so that's where it, it, it'll all, uh, you know, play around with. Right, right. Rajiv, how would you like to uh, add to this? Um, actually, I think everybody is covered and all of them are people are experts. Uh, so to that extent, I think everybody knows uh, the way it is. One good thing I would like to say about the BPO industry and the which surrounds the BPO, which is telecom and all these things, uh, nothing really happens overnight. So you have enough time to plan. So for example, people knew that 5G will come at a finite time. And if you want to prepare yourself and if you want to see how you can leverage 5G, um, you, you have enough time to plan it. So, you know, you gazing and you look a, a few years in the horizon. So AI, for example, we have been talking about AI for the last two years, but it's an evolutionary process. So AI doesn't happen overnight. It just doesn't drop from the sky. AI ready. It doesn't work like that, right? Yeah. And except for yes, which happened, um, uh, it had to happen all of a sudden at that point of time. So in March of 2020, when the lockdown happened, I guess nobody was expecting it. So once in a lifetime. So it's not that these things happen every day. So if, if, uh, like I said, because it's an evolutionary process, I think BPO leaders and the people here in this uh, panel have the time to plan and make yourself future ready. So okay. there is a human element, there's a technology element, there's a real estate element, there's a geography element which Sanjay mentioned. It is possible that if 5G is all over the country, uh, do we really need uh, you know fancy big buildings in places like Bangalore or Hyderabad or Chennai or Pune? Uh, you could be working from anywhere. So all those things. So it'll take time, but time to plan. Mm -hmm. And uh, good, solid BPOs will always do that. And whenever that moment happens, they are ready. That's it. Right, right. So just adding to that, I think when we talk about future ready BPOs, it's definitely a change in the making. And all of you have highlighted some great points here. Thank you for coming together for this conversation. It's been amazing. Thank you to the audience for staying with us till the end. There's also a feedback form in the chat section. I request you all to please uh, fill that up. That would be great. But once again, thank you so much, everyone for making time and it's been wonderful listening to you and learning from you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so of course, on the closing note, uh, uh, this is Ekta again from Brenalytics. So on the closing note, of course, I would like to thank uh, all the speakers, uh, Mr. Yaya, Mr. Lakhan, Mr. Saurabh, Mr. Rajay, Mr. Rajiv, Mr. Sanjay and Garima for making this session so interesting. Thank you audience for really engaging the chat box for lovely questions and making it so interactive. Uh, we would be sharing the entire session video with each one of you and also uh, would be a request of a brainstorm session with our partners Ozontel, and we would love to reconnect you with these guys so thank you once again everyone have a lovely day ahead and stay safe thank, thank you bye-bye thank you so much